I didn't even see you come in, but I knew you came in. You know how? I watched that little girl immediately run over there. <laughs> I, I noticed that you were missing, and I seen that little girl run out I thought, I see you today. Take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to Psalm 96. Now we're going to read uh, some verses in Psalm 96, and then we're going to read Acts 20, 27. Beginning at verse 3, the psalmist writes, Declare His glory among the heathen, His wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of people, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts and turn if you will please to Acts chapter 20 and verse 27. Paul speaking to the elders at Ephesus says this, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Let's pray. Our Father, we uh, thank you today for the privilege that we have to meet together once again uh, in this house of worship. Uh, Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have today to worship you, to give you the glory that belongs to you. Father, I pray that as we have come today, to give you the glory and to worship, that you would help us to give attention to your word. I pray, Father, today as we speak the truth that's in Jesus, that, Lord, the truths that we talk about this morning will most certainly find a lodging place in our hearts if they have not already. I pray that you will help us to be a people who are always ready to declare your word. Lord, may we never be ashamed. We, may we never be filled with fear of any kind. But Lord, may we go forth with a readiness to speak the words of eternal life to the heathen. Father, I pray today that you would fill me with your spirit. I ask that you would enable me to be the preacher, teacher that I need to be. And above all else, Father, I pray that you would get the glory. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. And so now we come to this third message that has to do with showing that we believe the Bible to be the Word of God. And this morning, we're going to talk about declaring the Word of God. Uh, declaring the Word of God, that is, declaring what it says, cannot be left out. Last Sunday, we pointed out what was true of Jeremiah, who devoured the Word of God. In Jeremiah 20 and verse 9, Jeremiah said that God's word was in his heart as a burning fire and that he could not forbear speaking what God's word said. God's word ought always to be a burning fire rather ready to be spoken by us unto this world. What a shame that when it comes to declaring 
what God's word says, many Christians forbear uh, because of fear of some retribution. No one gets saved apart from the hearing of the word of God. Romans 10, 14 says, how then shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And I believe that verse uh, means that every believer needs to be a preacher of the word. They need to be ready and willing to go about their heavenly father's work of preaching the gospel so that many may be saved. But there's also another way to declare the gospel uh, without speaking the word. And that way of declaring is that of living out the gospel. Now we've said it in here before, folks. The gospel changes you. A person who is truly born again does not live like the rest of the world. There's a distinct difference. And that distinct difference can be very, very obviously seen by the lost. And we need to understand very easily, we need to understand that living in obedience to God's word and practicing Christianity in this world is a major way of declaring God's word. Now, as we will point out, it's not the only way, and it can't be. But listen, how can you expect someone to listen to you and want to believe on Christ as you have if you yourself are not an example of what God has done in you. And uh, uh, sometimes our, our example betrays us. Uh, a believer who truly believes the word of God to be the word of God will live according to its teachings. Christians can live out the gospel before their bosses. Many people today who own businesses are lost. They are, they, they are uh, similar to the rich young ruler who Jesus told to go and sell all that he had and give to the poor. And that rich young ruler left Jesus sorrowing. Uh, Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. Jesus wasn't saying rich people can't be saved, but that it's more difficult. Most employers don't want their employees to witness to them verbally. But what's wrong with displaying a godly manner? Now, uh, listen very carefully, and this is our third and final point in this series of messages. Finally, we prove that uh, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God by declaring it. Let's say from the outset that uh, where we fail, when we fail to obey God's word, we not only fail to declare it, but we say to others around us, it's not God's word. A Christian declares the word of God when they live in obedience to it in the presence of the unsaved. Far too many Christians aren't always obedient to the word of God. 
while in the presence of the lost. I think sometimes there's a sense in which we feel we need to fit in. Uh, may I just say this to you? If you're truly a believer walking with the Lord, you're never going to fit into this world. I mean, you're always going to be, uh, so to speak to them, a sore. Uh, something that offends. Uh, believers should always keep in mind someone is watching them. Unbelievers should be able to see that believers have a hope to the point where they question the believer about that hope. Look at 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. <clears throat> But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You know, if, uh, if you're living right and doing what God wants you to do, the unbeliever will surely see in you a hope they don't have. I think uh, one thing that's so important is we're uh, in this so-called pandemic, this COVID-19. I don't believe as a Christian you ought to display fear. Uh, if you're like I am, and I wouldn't think you would be different in this sense. You understand that God's in control. Uh, the world doesn't understand that. I think sometimes some Christians don't understand that. Uh, obviously, God could have let this thing pass away a long time ago. But he didn't. Uh, he chose to let this country... Uh, fall prey to it. Why did he do that? Well, for one thing, it should be a wake-up call to the unbeliever. But death is a very imminent thing. You know, most people think they're going to live forever. And the sad thing is, a whole lot of people have died through this pandemic. But, but here's another thing. Christian, your approach as to how you handle it can be an effective instrument to them where God is concerned. Living in obedience before other believers is one thing, but quite another when lived before the lost. Sadly, some believers try to fit in uh, where the lost are concerned and lessen those standards of life taught in God's Word. Hence, lessen the importance of God's word where salvation is concerned. Uh, I want you to turn, if you will, please, uh, to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, and I want to look at verse 6. Uh, in fact, I want to read the passage. Let's just back up to verse 1. Uh, likewise, ye wives, live in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, uh, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of the hair and the wearing of gold or the putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in which is not corruptible even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in old time 
the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. And so if you will hear in this few verses that I just read, uh, Peter sets forth a place where living in obedience to God's word by the wife before her unsaved husband is important if she hopes to reach him. Uh, that word conversation comes from a Greek word that means behavior. Now, folks, I don't need to tell you how important your behavior is in this world. <clears throat> and it's unfortunate that every now and then a professing Christian uh, gives a bad image to Christianity in general. Now, watch this. The culture of that day was much more clearly defined in that women were viewed as lower than man, making the potential for conflict and embarrassment in a marriage of a believer and an unbeliever. Peter did not urge the Christian wife to leave her husband, but to preach to her husband, watch this, without the word, and by submissive conduct. Peter says that the husband may be won by her conversation or literally her behavior. I want to stop for a moment and look at verse 3. He says, who's adorning, uh, let it not be the outward adorning of the plating of the hair and of the wearing of gold and the putting on of apparel. Now ladies, listen carefully. God's not talking about the fact that you can't make yourself look attractive. That's not what he's saying here. But what he's saying here when it comes to reaching your wife, the ornament about you, the decoration about you, ought to be your life, how you live, what you do with your life. You know, uh, some Women like to nag their husbands where salvation is going to. I just say to you that that very seldom ever works. In fact, what it usually ends up doing is turn them off. And they just reach a place where they absolutely don't want to hear it. If, if you want to reach your husband, a lost husband, and it works the opposite. I know of a number of men today that are saved and married to unsaved wives. And wives can be just as about as thick-headed, is that right? Come on, ladies, help me out here a little bit. Example. Listen to me. Example. A, a missionary couple that I know, now they're not where they need to be today spiritually, but at one time they were. And she got saved as a result of his testimony. She gave this testimony to the church that I pastored. And uh, uh, he came home one day, he was a drunk, and he was on drugs and all kinds of things. And I don't know if you know much about the Newport News shipyard in Newport News, Virginia, but the shipyard down there has always had a group of men who have a Bible study on Friday at lunchtime. And a number of people have gotten saved, even called to the ministry out of that group. Isn't that, isn't that an awesome thing? Mm -hmm. But uh, this fellow uh, got saved, and he came home, and she was fixing to leave him. She had reached a place where she said, I, I don't want anything to do with him anymore. And he came home and told her he got saved, and she said to herself, you know, yeah, that's just another way to hold on to me. But she watched him over a period of several weeks and she saw there was a definite change. And so she went in uh, to uh, uh, her bedroom, got down by the side of her bed, and asked Jesus to save her. Uh, li listen, you'll never know the value of your testimony 
But one way to surely see some things about it is to live like you're supposed to be every day. Now, God never told us that living the Christian life would be a convenient thing. And sometimes I think as Christians we think it ought to be. Well, why should it be? You know, Jesus' life here on earth was not a convenient one. Not even close to that. Now, Peter in verse 2 declares that purity of life with reverence for God is what the unsaved husband should observe consistently. Look at verse 2. He says, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. You know, uh, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is a great thing. And uh, an unsaved wife or an unsaved husband, they're going to uh, look at... Uh, uh, that about you. What is it that you fear? You know, I don't fear man. I believe a man could kill me, don't get me wrong. But my Bible tells me not to fear those that are able to kill me. My Bible tells me to fear that one who is able to destroy most my body and soul in hell. The only person I know of he's talking about is God himself. Watch this. In verse 3, Peter was not condemning all the outward adornment, but pointing out that here, greatness of adornment before her husband has to do with that inner character. Now here's the second thing. But Christian, Christians also declare the word of God when he or she speaks the gospel. People need to hear the gospel if they are ever to be saved. Look at Romans 10 and verse 14. We read this earlier, but we got to come back again and put a little more emphasis on it because there needs to be an emphasis on it. But in Romans 10 and, and verse 14, we read this. He said, how shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? Or how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear uh, without a preacher? And the emphasis of that verse, I think, is extremely clear. No one, listen to me, no one gets saved apart from hearing the word of God preached unto them. I heard a man say this years ago when I was up in Pennsylvania pastoring, he was on a particular Christian station up there. It was out of Montrose, Pennsylvania. And he said, and I, I don't know if it was uh, 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 a part of him that he didn't think about what he was saying, but he said he got saved apart from hearing the word of God and I immediately had a red flag. Why? Because saving faith comes by hearing the word of God. That's an impossibility. Now, watch this. Note Paul's testimony and declaration. Turn to Acts chapter 20, verses 26 and 27. We read this earlier, but we're going to go back. Acts chapter 20. In verses 26 and 27. Paul writes, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. So we understand here that Paul didn't fail to share all that God's word says. Now, sometimes we'll come up short with the one thing that we need to say because we have an idea that if we say it like it needs to be said, we'll offend. Now listen very carefully. I believe that any person that really hears the gospel 
gets offended. I don't think anybody likes to be told they're a sinner, do you? I don't think so. And I think that we need to get past this idea, uh, I'm going to offend them. Uh, for many, it's the only way they're ever going to come to Christ if they do get offended. I like it when somebody gets offended, and I'll tell you why. I know I said what I was supposed to say. <coughs> now, if they walk away happy like, hey, good day, great, wonderful, I always think to myself, did I really share what I needed to share? Did that guy really get it? Now, when he says all of the counsel of God, that would most certainly include the gospel. The words pure from the blood of all men most certainly refers to Ezekiel chapter 3. Would you turn to Ezekiel chapter 3? And uh, I, I want to read this a few verses to you. Ezekiel chapter 3. Now, keep in mind that uh, the early church, uh, the most that they had was the Old Testament. The New Testament was in the process of being written. But in Ezekiel chapter 3, and this is a passage that stood out to me quite a few years ago and has ultimately been one of those driving factors when it comes to this business of winning souls. Please begin with me at verse 17 of Ezekiel chapter 3. Uh, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked, the same from his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Now look at me a few moments. I believe that every person who is a believer today is a watchman. Now, uh, I'm well familiar, this is a military term, and uh, Paul would be familiar with me. But a watch was a very important part in the military. Because uh, a watch's job was to be aware of the surroundings around him. Uh, he was to watch out that the enemy didn't slip in. And the military uh, calls that post uh, such a serious post that a person who went to sleep on watch could literally be shot. That was the punishment. Now listen, if there ever was a time when there needs to be a watch, it's today. We have people everywhere living their life without God as though they're going to live forever. And folks, listen. They need to be warned. Now, I want you to understand something about trying to reach lost people. Sometimes your reasoning for doing it as far as God is concerned is that they have heard the truth. You see, every person that stands at the great white throne judgment whereby God cast them into the lake of fire, I assure you that they will have heard the truth. Because that's who our God is. But listen, how does he make it so they can hear the truth from you and me or Christians? We are watchmen. We are watchmen for their soul's sake. And you'll notice in this passage that I just read to you that if we fail to warn, 
Look at the bottom part of verse 18. But his blood will I require at thine hand. What did Paul say? I'm pure from the blood of all men. Can you say that? Can you say that? I wonder how many of you could say, you know what, Pastor, I had the opportunity, but I didn't take it. I was afraid. I was worried about what the repercussions might be. I know that today, for instance, in many of the places of business, you're not allowed to leave a track. That's pretty sad. Uh, in many places, you're not allowed to witness. I think uh, public school teachers are somewhat limited, uh, Whitney. But you know what? Listen to this verse. This is what Peter said. We ought to obey God rather than man. And that doesn't mean, Whitney, you get up on top of the desk and preach. But I'll tell you what it does mean. God will give you an opportunity to be used by him if you're ready and willing. And I happen to know that there are a number of teachers today in our public school system locally that are Christians. Love the Lord. But here's the thing. I don't, I don't want the blood of any man to be on my account. And therefore... It's my job to warn. They may turn away from me. They may say, I don't want anything to do with you. That's fine. That's your choice. But I need to do what God has called me to do. And then we just simply leave the rest with him. Now, watch this. Watch this. Look at Romans 1.16. Romans 1.16. Paul sets forth a truth here that cannot be denied. Romans 1.16 He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. In other words, no one is going to get saved apart from hearing the gospel. And God has seen to it that the gospel itself has a certain power about it. And I don't know about you, I have watched people who did not receive Christ walk away with a sense of terrible guilt. In fact, I saw a man one time walk away in tears. It's not that he didn't know what to do. It's just that he wasn't willing to do it. And yet he walked away in tears. How do you do that? How do you do that? Uh, it means that he was right at that brink, but turned away. Uh, watch this. Watch this. To be ashamed means uh, uh, to uh, feel shame. How many of you have ever heard somebody say this and maybe you said it yourself, I'm ashamed of myself because I didn't say something when I had the opportunity. Can I hear you? Mm -hmm. Or I'm ashamed of myself that I didn't do what I was supposed to do when I had the opportunity to do it. Paul had been imprisoned in Philippi, chased out of Thessalonica, smuggled out of Berea, laughed at in Athens, regarded as a fool in Corinth, stoned in Galatia, but listen, always remain ready to preach the gospel. The Ethiopian eunuch was saved because a believer, Philip, preached Christ to him. Uh, Acts 8, 35 through 37. I'm not going to turn there. We've been there many times. However, if a believer fails to live out what the scriptures teach, 
and it's preaching is mute. Preaching the gospel is never to be lessened. Look at Matthew 10, 7. Matthew 10, 7. Jesus was sending out the twelve. Matthew 10, 7. As you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, he never told them to water it down so they might receive it a little bit easier, did he? Uh, he never told them to uh, make it seem like it was perfect and ideal. Because, you know what? When a person uh, trusts Christ as his Savior, he finds the world around him an enemy. Watch this. Watch this. Sadly, far too many times they hear what some say is the way to heaven, but it's really a lie from Satan himself. There's only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Being a Christian is a relationship, not a religion. John 1, 12, But as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 15, 15, Jesus said, I call you friend. It's a relationship. But here's the thing. If someone, a believer, does not preach the gospel to sinners, then they will die in their sins. They will go to hell after they die. The rich man was in hell in Luke 16, uh, 22 and 23. Lifted up his eyes in hell, the Bible said. They will be cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20 and verse 15. Whosoever's name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Our mentality must be the same as the Lord's. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 9. I'm going to close. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us where not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Close your Bibles and look at me for a little while.